Welcome back to the Amoris Patris podcast, Letters of Love from the Holy Father. Join us as we discover the truth, beauty and goodness found in papal and slickle letters with your friends Sam, Ruth and myself Giovanna. Hello G. Hello guys, very good afternoon. Hi. Hi Sam. Hello G. How is everyone doing? Good afternoon Gigi, good afternoon Sam. Um it's been a rather stressful week but oh my reading the second part is like truly brought back life to me. It's so amazing. And um so how are you guys doing? How are you Sam? What's happening? Ruth, same stressful week but you know the best part in the week was reading God is love, you know. It was so amazing every part of it and I was looking forward to recording and uh, thank God that he gave us this afternoon to record. post mass how has your sunday been well sunday goes as usual we have early morning 7 am mass that's the only english mass we get so i have no option but to wake up early and then i did some like revision for today's because i too had a stressful uh, week like both of you but so grateful that god is giving us the grace to come together at this time and um, I'm very very excited to discuss this part of the book. I think it's so full of wisdom. It's like a powerhouse of you know knowledge and wisdom for us and uh, as many people uh you know should should be reading this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um so I'm just happy that our uh, uh, our listeners as well have joined in on the reading plan and they've completed part 1. And now we're blasting off to part 2 and Part two starts off with Caritas, the practice of love by the church as a community of love. And I mean, the very beginning sentence is, "If you see charity, you see the Trinity," by uh, Saint Augustine. And you guys, um, I immediately um, my mind went back to the time I was reading uh, Christopher West's uh, Theology of the Body for Beginners, and he talks about this amazing uh, thing about the purpose of our existence, and that goes like. Here is why we exist. Love by its nature desires to expand its own communion. God certainly didn't need anyone else. The love of the Trinity is perfect and complete in itself. Yet out of sheer goodness and generosity, God wanted to create a great multitude of other persons to share in his own eternal ecstatic exchange of love. And I think this theme runs along throughout the entire part 2. What? How did you you guys feel reading it? I think I took a day to just read this uh, first paragraph, Ruth. I was so amazing just to see how Trinity is loving themselves, like between them, like Father loves Father who moved by love, and the Son sent into the world, died on the cross, and He gave up gave up His Spirit in anticipation of the gift of the Holy Spirit, all for us. And it's how to say, how to say, how to how to talk about this, you know. Trinity is a mystery, right? Uh, and then we would never be able to fully comprehend it. For me, this part of the book, you know, meant um, meant differently because I am currently engaged in the church's charitable activity. I am the person uh, responsible as being part of a Catholic NGO under the diocese. So you know, there was so much for me to reflect upon. my own responsibilities and my own um, how i do this work and um, it's so true how he mentions you know it is the spirit that is the interior power which you know harmonizes our hearts with christ and that's what makes us uh, you know that's what moves us to love the brethren uh, as christ loved them as we talked about in the previous part that you know love is a response because god loved us first and and then it comes out as a response because god loves my neighbor i too love him and um charity is you know at the heart of the service of the church so you know the church is responsible you know it's an expression of love and which seeks the integral good of man and how does it you know express this love first through the word then through the sacraments and the third is through charity that is love 
Caritas. Yeah, absolutely. And so where did all of this begin? It began from the um, teachings of the apostles um, in the early church while they were distributing uh, uh, goods and money to the widows. And that's where it began. That's where there was a need for the ministry of charity in the church as well. So, you know, some of the apostles were um, more... Um, you know, they were primarily concerned with, as you said, uh, the ministering of sacraments, the liturgy. And then that's why they needed another ministry for these charitable works. Because as you mentioned, G, um, it is inscribed in the, you know, in the responsibility of the church to um, minister charity. And uh, what do you think, Sam? Oh, I have a very personal connection with this. Uh, I still remember the day uh, when I was a Protestant, I was asked by a friend, uh, about a definition of the church and I've tried many ways uh, just to make sure that I land on the same page as he thinks about which was hard I was telling it's a gathering of people but um, was just giving all the definitions I know but reading this encyclical has actually made me a better you know has an- answered a lot of my questions and you know it made my heart light all the burden that I used to carry uh, for all these years you know has been made light by Pope Benedict thanks Thanks be to God for this, you know, first thing, first burden that is taken out is the element of tradition that is being continued and the definition of church first of all. St. Luke provides a kind of definition of the church in his Acts of Apostles. Like it it contains these three elements, teaching of the apostles, that's what we have been having in the tradition and communion which is the core uh, element, our source and summit and, and prayer and the third thing is the charity like I my search for the church began going back to the first century church because this was the verse that I believed all who believed were together and had all things in common and they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need and uh, this was one personal verse that I, I, I took and looked forward to and you know this this made me Catholic and this made me land in the Church of Christ the one faithful bride and also I have to say this, uh, on this on this lines of holding positions, there was no distinction between the rich and the poor. There were no distinctions. And yeah, my prayer is that we go back to the first century, first century church or the, like, you know, the church is one. Uh, yeah, it has to go back to the first elements that it was trying to live out and it lived out successfully back then. Yeah. Yeah. So I think most of us might be aware of uh, St. Justin Martyr. He wrote... Um, the first apologia um, and a whole branch of uh, uh, old sect to address and um, concrete questions in Christianity has the term apologetics, which is um, which is derived from his first work, Apologia. So he goes on to describe how the holy life of the church was with the participation of uh, Thanksgiving and the Eucharist and how everybody took part. And he also mentions how charity was um, was of prime importance. He talks about bishops uh, supporting orphans, widows, and sick, and all of these are uh, referenced in his works. And um, then uh, Pope B goes on to. I just said Pope B. <laughs> so Pope uh, Benedict the Sixteenth goes on to mention uh, Tertullian. Um, which one struck you the most, you guys? I think for me it was uh, Emperor Julian. What do you guys think? Emperor Julian the Apostate, I think he, he saw his family being murdered uh, and he blames it on Emperor Constantinus. And then who Constantinus goes out uh, by saying himself as a good Christian and, you know, he blames it on Christianity, like in the church, on the faith. And he says that, you know, I'm going to bring back the old pagan Roman religion and then I'm going to establish it because this thing killed my family and it, he took it personally. Yes, but you know what he did, the beauty of what he did was in bringing back the ancient pagan religion, uh, he was trying to incorporate the good from the Christianity that he saw. He saw in in a letter he writes, he says that the distinctive character that these people had was, you know, their service to the poor orphans and widows and their love, extraordinary love. There's these two verses that I remember, you know, this is... Uh, they'll know us by Christian. They'll know us as Christians by our love. They'll know us as Christians by our love. And even also, uh, I had a uh, while I was reading the you know the first book that I was asked to when when I was starting reading when I when I was told 
when i wanted to do apologetics uh, my friend told me just go go to the book of saint uh, james saint james and then start reading it and then list out a point 10 pointers on the first verse and i couldn't do it and then i bailed out and then started reading it at the end of the first chapter there's a verse to religion in a pure and undefiled way is caring for like widows and orphans in their state of affliction i couldn't understand why they why it's called true religion is caring for them but when while well, back then i was thinking that true religion is attending church praying being faithful and hopeful but you know and it i couldn't understand it right now i can understand it from this letter you know true religion is a constitution of all these things and charity is an indispensable element of it and uh, i love this how pope uh, p again i quote it pope b writes about it but its essential core remained within the community of believers there can never be room for a poverty that denies anyone what is needed for a dignified life in the house of god for me it was the story of uh, deacon lawrence from 258 ad so that's quite early in the church and we know that the first few centuries um in the life of the church was marked was marked by martyrdom and um so there was a time when uh you know he was uh, deacon lawrence was responsible for the care of the poor in rome and uh, he had been given some period of time to collect all the treasures of the church and hand them over to the civil authorities during the time of the persecution and also when the pope was uh, captured and what he did was he distributed to the poor whatever funds were available and then presented to the authorities the poor themselves as the treasures of the church i mean you know that just shows yeah that just shows how um you know the love of the poor and 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 charity has been you know engraved into our churches role like it's not that the church can abandon it as much as it can i mean uh, as i mean what to say yeah so the church cannot neglect this service of charity any more than she can neglect the sacraments and the word so that's that's how important Uh, it is in in the life of the church yes and i think uh, pope pius is really strong words uh, in order to show their correlations he says these duties presuppose each other and are inseparable presuppose as in it's a prerequisite as a requirement it's a condition that needs to be satisfied so yeah so far we have seen um, the individual and the local the particular and the universal church here in action how uh, from the acts of apostles and we see the local church the early church trying to follow the commandment love thy neighbor and in action and through in an individual way as deacon lawrence has done and uh, and going forward the establishment of the seven the seven especially in, as mentioned in the acts uh, the book of acts chapter 6 i guess i really have listed down the names Saint uh, Saint Stephen the martyr is in is in the top of the list and yeah i think the, the mission of charity uh, in uh, the church has been taking uh, root as a diaconia as a traditional service or a traditional uh, um, uh, how to say a structure and institution pope benedict also talks about like in egypt from the 4th century it started as a individual uh, in the in, in the diocese or uh, bishops level and then by 6th century it, it had a juridical standing uh, even civil authorities recognized it and it was uh, assigned the part uh, assigned the part of grain for public distribution and whenever i think of egypt why does egypt and grain distribution always go together since <laughs> since <laughs> the patriarch joseph it, it has been the same thing yeah so we moving on to justice and charity i think this is like um, the most awaited part for all of us and um book B starts by um talking about um the 19th century the marxist movement and um how the church's charitable uh, organization had objections from this movement which believed that um uh, the poor don't need charity but justice um i think they were quite oppressed um the working class and uh, they felt the need that people if um if if charitable organizations continued with their works of charity um it kind of masks the the abuse of power in been in you know in the um higher sections of the society so they just felt that instead of charity they could just have a proper social socially just system and um charity should be stopped so if there is charity nobody would uh, rise up and revolt and there wouldn't be a revolution and because of which they wouldn't have a better um socially just system so 
any thoughts on what you guys thought of this yeah i like the distinction that he made about justice and charity and how both are needed for the betterment of mankind so he talks about how justice is first of all the aim and intrinsic criterion of politics so you know the church is it's not the church's role to bring about justice and uh, politics is not it, it politics is more than just defining what what were the rules of the public life and justice the origin and goal of justice are found in the very nature of ethics so here comes the question like if the state is supposed to bring about justice but then what is justice right uh and the problem is that many people can without the understanding of an objective reality or an objective morality where there are certain things which are right, always right and there are certain things which are always wrong um you know there could be certain uh, you know ethical blindness due to some maybe some personal prejudice or maybe through the you know effect of power or some you know special interests so and this is where the church comes in and this is where politics meet meets faith um right because faith by its nature is what is it it's an encounter with the living god right and it it it, it opens up the horizons you know uh, which goes beyond the sphere of reason and and then he mentions about how i'm doing a very poor job at uh, you know uh, putting this into words because pope benedict is you know really he's so um he's so articulate with his writing but i'll just try and he talks about how you know why faith is required here is that faith is the purifying force for reason itself you know uh, a faith is what liberates a uh, reason from its blind spots and therefore you know it helps uh, helps it even more f- uh, to become even more fully itself and faith enables reason uh, to do its work more effectively and this is where the church church's role comes in what the church does is it helps to form the consciences of people who are part of the justice system so that they can truly decide what is uh, objectively right or objectively wrong and this is the you know the current example we can give is of roe versus wade uh, uh, you know in the united states the supreme court 50 years ago decided that abortion should be a human right i mean is that justice from from god's point of view from uh, from from the point of view of objective morality is that justice or were the people who went on to bring about this decision um you know in the supreme court were blinded they were blinded by their own uh, sinfulness maybe blinded by their own prejudices that you know they could not see they could not see that what they were doing was such a horrific is so it's it was so wrong and uh, and now you see the justices in the supreme court um you know they are faithful christians and their consciences are formed and you all we all need to form our consciences and there's there's supposed to be a formation um you know which which helps us to distinguish between right and wrong and that's where uh, the church's role comes in justice as exactly, you said ji i was exactly think about the role we um played um you know overturnment during this part because i was talking to a friend and um she mentioned something like you know um because uh, there is no distinction be- distinction between the church and the state now with the uh, rovi wade being overturned it feels like another religion takes precedence over one religion and um for me i felt like okay no that's not that's not quite true because you know and as i read this um uh, pope benedict talks about how the second vatican council um calls for a separation of the church and the state right yes he talks about how the sep- there is a separation between the church and the state the state should not impose um religion yet it must guarantee that there is a religious freedom and there is a harmony between all the different religions and for her part the church as a social expression of christian faith has the independence you know uh to uh, to not just stand in the sidelines yes. to actually help people yes. think yes. towards you know yes. towards the natural law towards what is ordered yes so yes 
विच द स्टेट मस्ट हैज टू रेकनाइज truly yeah. it takes love to another level when it's not just being indifferent and standing on the sidelines that's what we're doing adding to what uh, joanna and ruth have said we both have said isn't it the church has been facing all these kind of uh, turbulent times again and again like marxism postmodernism modernism especially we have to talk about the industrialization and modern modernization of the society and the working class and then as jiona has told about like faith purifying reason and not purifying reason first of all the church has been commanded not to impose justice or like you know the, the lord rules over the earth and heaven and he is a just king and you know he rules the world with love and justice and uh, by the way we are called to love we are called to love and we are called to be faithful we are called to be hopeful and fa- faith as jiona said faith ha- faith has a characteristic of purifying reason and that's what as in as in the case of roe versus wade it has purified the reason you know uh in case of matters of you know birth control and stuff and the stupidity that they have put out over there and it has been doing it since and as a response to the modern modern modernization working class problems the landmark uh, magna carta uh, encyclical from saint pope leo the 13th rare environment 100 years of it pope saint pope john paul wrote about it sentismus annus and there there been lot uh, other uh, encyclicals which have been trying to purify reason like lord at to see about the environmental concerns fertility to tea about the uh, societal relationships like between different faiths different communities different races and stuff like it has been trying to purify reason in aim of love you also mentioned how god is the just king and god is the source of justice and he's the source of love he's the source of all goodness and it makes me think like what we talked about in the previous episode also like how true like if you don't drink from the fountain or where of the origin of justice or from the origin of love how are we supposed to bring about that justice and love to our neighbors and that's what the marxist um you know uh, ideology was it was trying to do good in their from for their their goal was good to bring about equality but but the means to 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 achieve that was was so uh, disordered because it was uh, so far away from it was totally disconnected to the source very source of love and um, this is what he talks about in the, you know the second the second part that you know even if you know the state provides everything you know even if pro- the state is you know providing everything to the people it would st- and if it's and but it the people would still need love right because it would always love or caritas will always prove necessary even in the most just society um and because love is essential to mankind and most people who are suffering you know even if they are suffering from material uh, deprivation most of the times what they need is that loving personal concern and this i can uh, you know like test i can i can testify this from my work um in the field when i go to the villages and i see uh, deprivation and suffering and um you know uh, grandparents are left alone and children are left alone uh, there are teenagers who are so lost like uh, why do you think they get into drugs or alcohol or um uh, teenage pregnancies because they are all looking for love which they don't find at home uh they're all everyone is looking to be loved so when they see someone their age or you know somebody who shows interest in them and you know instantly they uh, they get attached and uh, you know everyone wants to be loved and um without that you know without that it would really be um impossible to uh, really um, wipe away each and every kind of suffering i think absolutely yes and also uh, you know some social structures ignore the need for love they think that uh, charitable works are just superfluous and that brings down the dignity of man made in the image of god where love is the characteristic of man and um, i think that happens everywhere like man is brought down uh, to the levels of an animal like okay no oh yeah you need birth control you you don't have a mastery of yourself you don't know how to love properly or you don't require love you just need the basic essentials to just live and not thrive just to survive not truly thrive and experience the abundance of god's love 
so <laughs> and how to say the for, for false promises of the world like the man shall live by bread alone <laughs> by material success alone money alone no relation uh, no friends you know chase success and all this stuff that lives is empty at the end and gives life no meaning when you look back but i remember i i, I think i've read a letter of from a grandmother or a grandfather how they look back and they look at the first thing they talk about is like children grandchildren and then they talk about how they provided for them and then what they leave for them but they also talk about what they took like and they gave love and they took love and you know it's all about love love Yes. It reminds me of uh, the missionaries of Hearts Home also. Like uh, I remember Sister Anne talking about how uh, you know it's not just material poverty that we encounter when we meet people. Uh, there's a lot of other kinds of poverty, spiritual, and um, you know which we need to address. And you see, you know, uh, the highest rate of suicides are in the most uh, the richest and wealthiest countries. Um, the Scandinavian countries have the highest rate of suicide. and you, and you think about this like you know they have people have all the material goods that they can ever get and still people are not happy you know and then that that says something doesn't it yeah like jesus was so right when he said like man shall not live by bread alone <laughs> so yeah and also i really want to quote this line from pope benedict um because in addition to justice man needs and will always need love we always need love and church is one that has always been like in action and providing love and how does it provide love and i i'm so amazed at this you know uh, it is ministering to us the love of christ through the sacrament of eucharist which is like you know thanksgiving and love feast it's called wow and um, i think i remember this 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 words from the scripture that god says like you know Uh, i am the bread that came down from heaven i will feed on me shall never see death oh like we live forever wow you know of course the church is never exempted from practicing charity as an organized um, activity right this is an organized activity of the church but on the other hand there can also never be a situation where the individual christian is exempted from his or her own duty uh, to um, provide uh, i mean to participate in this act of uh, charity so he also talks about the role of the lay faithful um in also fulfilling this duty individually so and then he also yeah he also talks about how as citizens of the state um it's not that just because we are christian and we're not we're not of the world of course but we are living in the world and we have to participate in the public life um you know in a personal capacity uh you know so he says they cannot relic relinquish their participation in the many different economic social legislative administrative and cultural areas which are intended to promote uh, organically and institutionally the common good so it is the mission of the lay faithful therefore to be part of this social life to be part of the public life and bring in um, what the church teaches and you know i used to think that i would never work for the sec- for a secular organization or i i could never work for an organization um whose uh, values don't align with uh, what i believe but then i think about then how am i supposed to bring that into the world right if i believe something like and that's what he says we cannot shy away and uh, live in our you know corner and live in into the you know in the in the walls of the church and we have to go out and be part of the public life uh, either it's politics economics and we have to bring in our faith and what the faith teaches to this public spheres because because they are all uh, intended for the common good of man yeah i think yeah when I, whenever whenever i was reading this uh, encyclical the part 2 uh he talks about the charity uh, in a context of you know divided into three but united in action like at the local individual level and at the particular and the universal level of the church and you know he changes between but the act but the thing is similar when he talks about the current state of the charitable services you know the multiple uh, current state of the charitable services in the context and it says that the church is always very Uh, how to say the church the task of the church is to uh, love and you know and 
and how it is cooperating with the charitable agencies of the different like you know different communities along with the civil authorities and you know because it shares the same fundamental motivation and the same goal a true humanism and 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 it and it is the truth and it knows the truth saying man is made in the image of god and it wants to help him to live in the same way and with the same dignity yeah sam i think what you said was absolutely right and uh, uh pobi also talks about uh, considering some situations like uh, how mass communication i think when he wrote this encyclical it was during 2005 and he talks about communication bringing out people together and right now um i'm pretty sure it's expanded so much we can reach anybody and everybody and um even our thread i mean the three of us joining together uh, being uh, in solidarity and <laughs> recording this podcast technology has been such and uh, such a bliss truly for all of us and um it also helps in the you know in the ministry of the church with respect to the inclusiveness with respect to the solidarity despite everything else that's happening um that's what technology does right now and i'm glad we're using it for the better so adding to what you said ruth i want to read this you know yeah uh, because of the mass communication there's been like you know increase in diversified organizations engaged in meeting various human needs is ultimately due to the fact that the command of love of neighbor is inscribed by the creator in man's very nature and i think we recognize it and uh, i see a faint uh, uh uh like you know i see people who do charity my friend does like you know uh, does it and she feels like you know she feels more human in that rather than being isolated and running after money it's it's there's a joy in sharing your resources your time your money and you know uh, your your yourself in meeting the need of the other maybe material other Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think I've heard this one too that you know therapists recommend people who are uh, you know struggling with uh, certain me- mental illnesses to go out there and volunteer because you know they come in fa- face with the you know they come in face with the needs of the others and they don't do themselves um they don't do just the other person a favor but they also do themselves a favor as you mentioned with regard to your friend as well. adding to what you have said ruth in this increase of this mass communications and uh, connectivity there's also increase in the diversified organizations engaged in meeting various needs which ultimately is due to the fact that the command of love of neighbor is inscribed by the creator in every in every man's heart in in his own very nature don't you think uh, that other during the, especially during this covid covid time like i had a lot of struggle everyone came together there was no barriers first thing was like you know uh, there were people from other religions just trying to come out and just they doing their part in helping there was humanity at display there was love at display what do you I, guys think i think it's absolutely commendable that you know that is true humanity uh, you know uh, when people were dying alone and in order to give them a decent burial i think there was a particular a uh, muslim organization which took that up and you know buried these bodies and gave them due dignity even in death and that was just astounding for me and as he said sam it is inscribed in the very nature of man love for neighbor um, god's love for uh, you know man and man's love for his neighbor is just very much ingrained in our hearts and i think that's where it stems from even if they do not know the entirety of the christian truth they still act on what is in their hearts and that's just beautiful thank you and i greatly admire this uh, akshay patra organization too by, about the kind of quality food that they provide yes, and yes. hats off to the quality and you know exact uh, the efforts i think we uh, you know i think something that uh, is prevalent is that uh, some of us are like oh these organizations they'd never be as good as us but come on they are doing they are playing a part yeah, i yeah. think we must never have that competitive spirit when it is for common good right exactly and what makes us distinctive mm. any any thoughts on That's this a good um, point. yeah pope benedict gives us three points on why um you know what makes the church's uh, charitable activity distinctive and how it should be distinctive uh, following from the teaching of our lord and the first one you know he talks about 
is that of course we need professional competency so those people even involved in the church organizations who are doing this work professionally they should be competent right they should be properly trained in what they do and how they do it but he says you know uh, we are dealing with human beings and human beings always need something more than technical uh, technical uh, proper care they need humanity they need that heartful heartfelt concern and this is so true because you know as human beings we come with so much uh, so many different emotions and moods and uh, environment and situations you know not every person is going to uh, behave the same way uh, there's a lot of um, you know from my experience of working in in meghalaya has been like most of the problems are behavioral you know it's not something that the state can even um, even even uh, address because it's not it's beyond the state's um uh, 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 you know capacity to change these behaviors so like he said like you know it is these we are dealing with human beings and um they're more than numbers you know they're more than date they they're more than the data that we talk about like you know behind this kind of data that we are analyzing um there are people you know with different stories um with different emotions and yeah it's really a complex thing that we are dealing with and um you know he he also talks about how you know these persons uh, or or sorry the the church is charitable organizations must be distinguished by the fact that you know we just don't we don't just merely meet the needs of the moment but that we dedicate ourselves completely and fully giving ourselves to others uh, with heartfelt concern and enabling them to experience the richness of their own humanity it's really about joining with them uh, and to an individual level how it looks for me and uh, you guys as well is i think if we have a friend who's in need or somebody who is in a time of need we truly can't give out uh, you know um a one time solution or a one size fits all solution we've got to be with them and journey and that is a lot more tougher than anything else <laughs> i think even through our friendship we have learned that right um to be there maybe sometimes just as a listening ear and to just journey with each other and um that's what we need to do in charitable organizations as well yes yeah and one more thing in this part i would like to add he talks about how there has to be you know apart from the professional training there has to be a formation of heart um because love is essential to all activity and you know he says that and this formation of heart has to be led by the encounter with god in christ you know who awakens his love and um so all those who are part of the church's charitable organization must first and foremost have a living uh you know striving relationship with the lord um which is what's going to you know help them to truly uh carry out their day to day responsibilities and uh, adding to what jiana said you know the church is independent of parties and ideologies and it's only uh, and it's it's only thing is it's only aim is like it's a way of making present here and now the love which man always needs like the love of god and through the through being there and you know there's a line that pope uh, benedict writes here the christian program independent of every strategies and parties and ideologies is the program of the good samaritan and the program of jesus is a heart which sees the heart sees where love is needed and acts accordingly yeah. this reminds me of the formation of heart to see where it's needed and act accordingly as we have seen in the time of covid everyone you know show their own <laughs> the, the nature as a uh, creator has I designed think, yeah i think that's something we need to hold close to us as well you know you see a need you feel a need regardless of uh, how um, superior you think or how inferior you think the job is you just see the need and you try to fill it that's humility as well <laughs> so the third point would be um something that you know uh, we all can relate to as such and i think something that we all struggled with when we try to do good for somebody um i think we have that uh, you know we have that uh, need to put out our faith out there like you know um try to convert them and i think that was seen um during the early organizations in the church and um uh, 
the church is uh, strictly against this sort of uh, measure where you impose your faith on others it's also called proselytism right through the charitable works you try to impose the christian faith and um, that is not how it works and uh, you guys i'm just going to tell you the story about uh, mother teresa that i heard so um about how you know you all of us know mother teresa and her amazing uh, missionary of charity organization so this was narrated by a brahmin student who went to meet her because uh, mother's uh, fame had reached all across india so from karnataka he traveled to meet uh, mother and she was uh, at that point she was uh, nursing a elderly woman and this elderly woman really wanted to meet her son but uh, mother tried to contact her son and uh, she wasn't able to get through to him or he said something like i am not willing to see my mother anymore and uh, finally uh, that woman um, was a brahmin woman as well uh, during that night mother sat by herself consoling her that you know her son will come and see and uh, she just sat by her bedside and uh, the woman passed away and a uh, mother uh realized that she was brahmin and she called her son again but the son was uh, least bothered to come and meet uh, his dead mother so uh mother teresa called out to this uh, brahmin boy and asked him to perform the last last rites of for this woman in the brahmin custom as a, a son would do for his mother and uh, i think that is where the heart of love comes without imposing the faith in respecting the other person's religion and truly loving is what that was for me um, so what do you guys think about this and even i have my fair share of uh, criticisms and uh, you know bad rap from my friends that what the church actually does is give a gray uh, give a rice bag and make you know uh, <laughs> rice bag converts i remember that yeah but you know i want to address uh, this thing you know i was silent because they were, what they were sharing was not reason but pain Truly. you know i had my close friend who was who, who has a personal experience of it and you know all i could just look at him was like this the state of the church on this part you know there are states like you know there are parts there are uh, state in the sense like conditions uh, where this is happening you know and the saddest part is that we don't encourage it it's not part of it and pope benedict offers a response on this uh, often the deepest often the deepest cause of suffering is the very absence of god as gave me tears actually like you know tears welled up in my heart when i read this often the deepest cause of suffering is the very absence of god i think this is what every human heart yearns for like the first question in philosophy like when i was studying was i searching for the ultimate reality like you know your 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 there's a and saint augustine talks about it like you know our hearts are restless until they rest in you and the next he talks about those who practice charity in the church's name will never seek to impose the church's faith upon others as ruth was talking about uh the example from mother teresa they realize that a pure and a generous love is the best witness to the god in whom we believe and by whom we are driven to love a christian knows when it is time to speak of god and when it is better to say nothing and to let love alone speak he knows that god I is love i think we have spoken about this um on even talking to our non christian friends when they are suffering we cannot just put it out there and sometimes silence and presence goes a long way in uh, you know them truly feeling what god's love is like right exactly and consequently the best defense of god and man consists precisely in love um so we're moving on to the next part which is those responsible for the church's charitable activity and i think the primary responsibility for carrying out these activities um you know it was set forth by the acts i mean it was set it was a program set forth in the acts of the apostles so now the bishops are charged in overseeing it but however when a priest when a nun takes up their uh, you know their orders when they are ordained um it's truly you know um they are called to express how much they are willing and how much they are um, going to commit to this very ministry of the church and i think that is just beautiful and that's what our priests and nuns are uh, constantly looking to do and you know as they are human beings as well they may falter and we need to constantly pray for them <laughs> so that is something that's there 
and um i think he goes on to say that uh, the church's activities must not be inspired by the ideologies running in the world but because you know ideologies um, always uh, answer the here and now they don't look towards an end towards a future um, it's all about you know that instant gratification sort of thing and um, i mean pope goes on to say that it should be guided by faith which works through love and that is just so beautiful and um, it helps us to keep that common goal throughout right and he talks about how the proper way of serving others is through humility you know it's not that those who serve others are somehow superior to the ones who are being served even if their uh, suffering is very big and uh, you know just as christ took the lowest place in the world uh, the cross and by his radical humility he redeemed us and constantly comes to our aid uh, so also those you know who are serving others are are to Uh, humble themselves and because you know this duty is a grace um whatever i can do for my neighbor is through the grace of god and uh, you know as he quotes uh, luke chapter 17 10 we are but useless servants right we recognize that we are not acting on the basis of any superiority or greater personal effic- efficiency it's not that i am more efficient than the other but because the lord has chosen to graciously enable me to do so so each of us has a different role in the church to play and each in it depends on the grace and what the lord's will for our lives is and how you know he has given each of us different talents and he wishes to use these talents for his greater glory and for the uh, betterment of his church so you know i like this part where you know we are but useless servants you know and whatever i do it's not because of because i'm superior or because i'm somehow more courageous or i'm i'm more bold no it's not like that it's because the lord has enabled me to do so through his grace and you know when we work in and it this i can relate to because when you work in the social uh you know social sector it's very easy uh to fall into two types of ideologies i mean uh, you know two types of thoughts like one one extreme is that you think that you can resolve each and every burden each and every suffering of the world taking up god's role okay that's one that's one danger thought and the other thought is that because you see nothing really changing you may just lose hope you go into despair and you think that you go into this inertia like because anyway nothing is changing right and that happened with me when i came here and i was so excited like okay i'm going to work and social work and i'm going to change lives and then you actually work on field and you see like it's quite a slow process and it's very difficult actually to change people uh to change behaviors or you know it's very difficult you know it's very difficult and and i used to you know my the per, the priest i used to work with would ask me like are you discouraged and i would be like mm, yes and then you'd be like no you cannot be discouraged no we must move ahead we must move ahead like just within the first three months he asked me this question when you see these problems around you know when you move around the villages when you see people sufferings are you discouraged um and then he would tell me like no you cannot be discouraged we have to move forward you know so and uh, and what is the solution to this you know and pope benedict so rightly says it's the living relationship with christ uh which is you know which is perfected which is um grown through prayer uh you know his prayer is a means of drawing closer to god to his love to his strength and um people who pray are not wasting their time you know to uh, to those who are not in the faith it may think when we say we'll pray about it people may think that oh that's just a waste of time because they think that nothing is happening but we know that prayer is so much more powerful right and um uh i like this i will read from here just one thing he talks about um the time devoted to god in prayer not only does not detract from effective and loving service to our neighbor but is in fact the inexhaustible source of that service yeah and then he talks about person mother like person mother teresa which she already uh, spoken about so yeah this was a very l- big learning experience for me that if i have to go out and help these people i must first have a living relationship with christ and because our hope is in him and he's our hope we cannot fall into despair yeah during 
the initial phase of my conversion i thought okay if i just uh, maybe call this person out on their sin or if i just uh, give them the right arguments they will be converted they will be renewed and all of that but <laughs> truly it's god's grace that works and every time we face failure it's um it's more to you know it's a call to lean towards his grace all the more and that's the most humbling thing and uh, you know as all of us we standing up for the truth uh, we must truly never be discouraged as the priest told you because you know it's not in our hands um, it all rests in our in his hands we should do our bit as a church as individuals and that's what pope says as well yeah he talks about how it is such a you know the importance of prayer in the phase of activism uh, that and the charitable work we do because you know see we don't claim that um, uh you know prayer will be able to change god's yes. plan or correct what he has for he has you know foreseen but rather you know we seek an encounter with the father of jesus christ and ask him to be present uh with the consolation of the spirit right and just as jesus uh even during his suffering said like you know why have you forsaken me like we're just asking the father to be present with us uh, and give us the strength and grace to um to to do to, to love our neighbor see Yeah. I think I love that part because you know uh, we have been taught that oh no you should mm-hmm. not question you should not question God mm-hmm. and your suffering but no God is abba he's our father and we get to talk to him to ask him to you know even wrestle mm-hmm. with him like Jacob mm-hmm. right that's that builds our relationship so close to him and it, he makes I mean it makes it so much more yeah. enduring so faith hope and charity go together and uh, I uh, I I really have uh, been thinking about this like uh, even if I do everything the, the the same the same chapter the famous chapter in uh, letter to Corinthians even if uh, if I give away all I have and I, if I deliver my body to be burned but do not have love I gain anything and then you know he talks about you know how love is the core but you know but these three go together faith charity and love uh, uh recently i got a comment and you know i was a discuss a discussion with friend that you know the love of christ is true and every else uh, says like you know comparatively false or like comparatively not up to the mark yeah and i was thinking on it you know when someone talks about you know love uh, like you know yeah i agree with that the love of christ is supreme and it's you know is god and you know is love and we as humans are tainted and you know we are struggling and you know we just that's why we need uh, you know the love of god just to show that what love is and that's when i understood when i read this line you know uh, how it's make you know uh, how love is possible and we are able to practice it because we because we are created in the image of god and then i understood you know it's possible it's not that the our love is falls our love is yeah it it is not up to the mark like you know love of christ but we when we allow the spirit which is the energy and who is the energy and the transforming power who who through us will you know and enable the enable, enable the love of god to flow through us you know the rivers of living water yeah i think you know hum, we are capable of love and that's one one thing i have understood and you know hope faith yeah lot much to talk on this yeah these three going together like it's it's a it's a hope i love this quote from gk chesterton like you know hope is a virtue when everything is like you know hopeless you know hope is a virtue only when everything is hopeless guys uh, my f- most favorite part of this encyclical i think like jesus <laughs> i'm saving the good wine to the end i love this oh my god i love saints you know why you know thank you pope benedict and thank you lord for this encyclical because it has opened up it has cleared a lot of my doubts it has made my heart light and it has reduced my suffering in in ang- and anguish first thing is like saints saints are the best examples that we look for like, look to look up to like and uh, pope benedict talks about saints how they loved and how they uh, they were examples in practical daily lives how they uh, like you know take mother teresa how she was uh, how she loved the poor and the sick you know seeing the face of jesus in them and here he talks about martin of tours nice name and he gave half of his cloak to a poor man and i love this and in the night you know jesus appeared to him in the dream wearing the cloak and you know and he hit on pope benedict i think it's very personally talks about you know confirming the permanent validity of the gospel saying i was naked and you clothed me yes i think that uh, i did mention this uh, in the previous episode as well 
but the visitation you know mama mary is truly you know she truly led by example right for each one of us and you know she was um at the point pregnant as well and she did not mind that and uh, it was i think uh, the present time the distance uh, from mama mary's place to uh, st elizabeth is around 100 kilometers or so if i'm not wrong and those days she had to travel by foot and uh, imagine you guys <laughs> would any of us even imagine or fathom that you know we would do something like that but it was so beautiful and um, i think i've read this during the uh, morning offering for our lady and uh, there's a particular quote from um, from pope john paul he talks about how um, our lady's faith was renewed through this uh, it was affirmed it was affirmed through this encounter with elizabeth through the words she said and uh, you know it truly um, it, it was such a beautiful time of their meeting and uh, we are also called to have this um, selfless form of love mm. so yeah i mean Ma- mother mary is the model christian and he talks about how you know mary's greatness consists in the fact that she wants to magnify god and not herself um that is why um she's the model christian because we are all to uh, magnify god and uh, be open to his will always and um you know she was a woman of hope faith and charity um, we've already spoken about charity uh the visitation and uh, she was a woman of hope because uh, you know she believed in god's promises and she awaited the salvation of israel and uh, she was a woman of faith uh, as uh, elizabeth says to her blessed are you who believed and um, pope benedict talks about how she was so at home with the word of god you know with ease she moves in and out of it she speaks and thinks with the word of god the word of god becomes her word and her word issues from the word of god and because she is so completely in you know has this complete union with the word of god she is also able to become the mother of the word incarnate and um then he says of course she is also a woman who loves because you know as a believer who who in faith thinks with god's thoughts and wills with god's will she cannot fail but to be a woman of love and uh, you know when we talk about love what is one example that uh, you know the world looks up to is like the love of a mother for her child and i look at a lady like son of a womb you know where she was and how she was willing to just step down and then willing to be near the cross when no one was there around just standing there looking at her son pierced and all the stuff you know mother's love mother's love and i can't imagine no one on earth could have ever loved jesus like you know like how his mother loved you know she bore him 9 months and then she raised him and she might have uh, you know uh, you know watched him grow in wisdom and you know and when he talk in the sorrows of her heart you know how she bore them like you know and then and how he how she loves all of us like you know there was this you know, instagram post i've been thinking about you know there's you know you remember you have a mother and she's the queen of heaven and i was saying it to myself all this week and uh, you know hail mary you are amazing <laughs> thank you jesus yeah yeah and so amazing that the church gathers around her during the day of pentecost and you know i don't i mean, I, i don't know how she uh, you know uh, uh she might have felt like you know looking at her resurrected son and the lord you know and i know it's the dynamics are too different now you know but he you know her son is always a son <laughs> amazing and that's why you know the lives of saints and our lady doesn't end over here and they are continued even in heaven and they are for us they intercede for us and they're working in god after death you know and they're role models for us we ask their prayers and you know we we imitate and we we has the help in the in our imitation of the, like you know exactly and I, it makes so much sense isn't it what do you guys think about it absolutely and that's why i think um aja for benedict 
um, says that we entrust this uh, ministry of charity to our mother and uh, she will take care of it and lead the church to where it should go yeah and we finally come we finally come to the last lines to her we entrust the church and our mission in the service of love and the beautiful prayer that pope benedict has written john and maria would you like to recite it for us for all of our audience of course holy mary mother of god you have given the world its true light jesus your son the son of god you abandoned yourself completely to god's call and thus became a wellspring of the goodness which flows forth from him show us jesus lead us to him teach us to know and love him so that we too can become capable of true love and be fountains of living water in the midst of a thirsting world yes thank you guys we just finished the whole of the encyclical yeah our very first a whole lot of things to talk about wow. but yes. it was so enriching Yes. quite an enriching and conversation to all our audience i just want to add guys all this week while i was reading i just reached out to a few friends of mine on instagram and while i was reading i just get inspired and say guys you should read this this is so amazing and then every catholic young person especially every catholic young person uh should read this encyclical because this is so important this is so important and you know we ask me the reasons we made two podcast episodes we made a reading plan we made post like it doesn't mean uh, that we forcing but you know we have a we have we have come to a conclusion that you know pope benedict took pains to write this took a heart took a took took hearts of love pains of love to write this and we took uh, our time and efforts just to make podcast and read and you know just yes just put our, our our words over here just so that you all can listen to this and also our aim is you read the encyclicals you get benefit out of it you personally encounter the encyclical and then take the words of love that holy father has written for you amoris patri stands for that you know we're just a medium we just we just like imitating our lady we just withdrawing ourselves and we are helping you just to see and look at these encyclicals and then find the best and you know just be blessed on it thank you so much guys congratulations jana and ruth and me myself and i <laughs> Um so thank you guys for listening along um throughout this time with us and uh we appreciate your feedback very much and um please reach out to us on Instagram or uh, anywhere else and also um we'd like for you to stay tuned for our next encyclical and uh, so um please share this podcast as well um like comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel and um please uh, subscribe to us and follow us on our um other platforms as well whatever is convenient for you we just uh would love for you to join us thank you. and um thank you so much you guys uh thank you g thank you sam thank you bye bye and have a lovely week